once once I do get your guys' names down, don't ever move your chair or your seat because then I'll never remember anyone again. All right. Devon Brooks or Devin? Darina? Janet? David? Michael? Some of you guys help me out by having little pictures of you. So it's like that, that gives me... That gives me uh, an advantage. Uh, Stephen Mott? Pamela? Joseph Sullivan? Garrett Sermon? Is Nada? Kelly? Trendle? Ryan Walla? You're the guy who knows Jesse, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to put a special note about that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Zachary Webb? All right. Uh, last time we went over um, creating links. We went over creating a unordered and ordered list. I'm trying to think of what else. A in addition to reviewing a number of other tags. So let's take a minute to, to look at that, see if there's any questions, and then we'll continue on. What I expect today to cover is, is what? Is a little more about links, different kinds of links that you can have on your page, um, images, and uh, some CSS stuff. All right, so that's what I expect to go over today. All right, here is the page that we did last time. Interestingly enough, this is just as relevant today because there's another game tonight. So I still have the dilemma of where I'm going to get my pizza for tonight. And I think pretty much everything that we said is relevant. Everything we said last time is relevant. Except between last time and this time, I had a payday. So money is less of a consideration than it was on Thursday. All right. Let's look at the stuff that we had. Oh, we also covered different, um, they're called top-level structure tags, things like article, header, nav, and so on. That was an important thing. And again, it's not quite so important now because um, we're doing pretty uh, simple uh, stuff with our pages. When we get more involved with the styling, it will become more relevant and, and more important. So, here we are, headings, paragraphs, lists, links, and so on. Let's look at the code. Now, the one thing I think I forgot to mention last time was it's important to turn the file extensions on, all right? Because if we look at the file here, we'll see pizza is the name of the file, and we can tell it's an HTML file because the icon is of an Internet Explorer. Now, that's okay, but as developers, we need to know precisely what the name is. And a file's name consists of two parts. It's like a first name and last name. There is the, the file name itself, and then there's the file extension. And the file extension determines like what programs are used to open it, and so on. And typically those are hidden from typical users because there's really no need to see it and it's just as confusing and, and so on. But as developers, when we start creating links and using images and so on, it's important for us to know the like, exact name. For example, an HTML file can actually have an .html extension. It could also have a .htm extension. Both of those are HTML files. If you're creating a link to another file, you have to get the name precisely right. So you have to get whether it's a .html or .htm. So we're going to go in, I'm going to turn file extensions on, and this is how you do it in this version of Windows. Under Organize, Folder and Search Properties, View, and I check this off, I uncheck this where it says hide extensions for known file types.
And now we can see the full name of the file, including the .html extension. Pizza.html. All right, we're going to open it up in Notepad. Remember, as I said before, here we're seeing the page itself. We're seeing it through the browser. This is how most of the world would interact with this page. If we want to see the, the insides of it to make changes to it, we need to go into some editor. So we're going to go into Notepad, and I'm going to open it up. I have to change it from text documents to all files. And here we go. Here's a different view of the page. It's the same page. There's only one file, but this is a different view. Now, uh, a student asked me almost at the very end of class last time, how do you put a comment in your code? Those of you who've done other kinds of programming know that comments in the code can be very important. You can explain things. You can give notes. Again, the computer disregards them. The browser disregards them. But they're useful for anyone coming back in at a later time to, to see, a little piece of explanation. And so I put a comment up here. And it's the lesson sign, exclamation point, dash, dash, starts a comment. And then dash, dash, greater than sign, ends a comment. Now in this case, I just put a simple note that says, this was written by me. All right? So for example, if we were at a larger organization and there was something that was confusing on the page, like why did the person do it this way, all right? This will at least be a note saying I'm the one that made this page. And whoever is going back to make a change to it could go in and ask and say, hey, why did you do such and such this way? So it's a little bit of explanation that you can put in the code. And you can put it for anything that you want. Some people use a lot of comments in HTML. Some people don't use many in HTML. All right. All right. Doctype tells the browser what kind of file it is. HTML tag surrounds the entire contents of the web page, starting and ending. All right. The tags go together. There is a head section and a body section. Typically, you will always have both of those in your page. Within the head, right now, all we're going to have is a title tag. To review from last time, in this case, this tag is all on one line. It really doesn't matter if I do it that way or if I do it this way. All right. The browser ignores the white spaces, the extra, the extra carriage returns and all that. So I can put it whatever way I think it looks better, is more readable. Just like comments, the way that we space out our code is a way to make the code more readable. So if we go back at a later time and want to make a change to it, if we lay it out in a certain way where it's readable, it's easier for us to make change. So much of what we do in all forms of software development is based on what we can do to make our life easier later on. All right? Make it easier to change. We know that things are going to change. We know that for whatever reason, we're going to have to go back at some point and change this web page. Therefore, we write the page in such a way that it's easy for us to do it. And we'll learn some basic techniques like we're doing here with the indenting and, and comments. There's some more uh, involved techniques that, that you can learn to make your pages more maintainable, and we'll look at them as well throughout this course. The idea is, is that anytime I say it's a good idea or it's a good practice to do this, what I probably mean is if you do this, it will make your page a little bit easier to maintain later on. So notice again, all the tags within the body are indented. So I can see at a glance what belongs where. I can take my glasses off and am not able to read any of those tags, yet I know that this stuff is within this tag, all right, just based on the fact that that's indented, all right. 
My basic structural tags, the body itself is broken into a header, a nav, article. I have a couple articles on this. And then finally I have a footer. Now you may or may not have all of those on any given page. All right. Typically you're going to have a header because you want to make it clear right off the bat what the page is about. Typically you're going to have a navigation, especially if the page is part of a website where there's multiple pages. Article, you may or may not have. You may have articles or you may have sections. You may have asides. All right, all of these are things that you can have and they're just pieces of your content. And then finally, typically you're going to have a footer where you put things like copyright and, and so on. We looked at links last time and we looked at two kinds of links. One was a link to another page out on the web, a page that we did not create. And the syntax for that is this. We have our starting tag, A. We then have an attribute, href equals. And then we have the name of the web page that we want to link to. And we start with http colon slash slash. That indicates to the browser, hey, this is out on some other web server. This isn't part of my website. This is on someone else's website. We have the text of the link. And then we finally have the end tag. Remember, links are tags that typically have attributes with them. Most, many tags can have attributes. So what attributes are are additional pieces of information. All right? It's not enough to say that I have a link to another page. What's the other page that I'm linking to? There's literally billions of pages out there on the web. Well, which one of those am I linking to? I need to specify I'm linking to this one. And that's the additional piece of information that you get in the href. That says, okay, I have a link, but it's not a link to Google or Yahoo or Pizza Hut or whatever. It's a link to oldtownpizzahouse.com. All right? We looked at another kind of link, which is with the pound sign and a name for the href. That is linking to a different section of the page. And notice in this case I designate where that section is by putting an ID on one of the elements. So in this case I'm saying I'm making a link to the Old Town section. That's what the pound sign means. So that means that it's a link to this part of the page. And then finally we have href pound sign which indicates the top of the page. So if we're viewing this in the browser, no matter what the size of the page is, if I click this, I go up to the top. Not to the top of the page, but to the top of that section. Click that, I go to that page. Any questions about the tags here on this example that we went over from last time? This is pretty much a review of what we went over. But really, in the first two classes last week, we actually went over a good amount of stuff. All right. Now, there's still a lot of stuff to go over, but the concepts of tags, nesting tags, all right, starting and ending tag, attributes, those are important ideas. And as we go over new tags, yeah, there's a lot of other tags, but we're going to build on those things that we covered for these tags. Any questions about this? All right. Let's say I wanted to make another page. All right. So if I look at this web page, I see... There's a certain amount of content on it. Let's say I wanted to add, if you remember, one of the other options that we had last time is we had, you know, chain pizza stores. All right? 
So let's go and let's add that. And I could have a lot of information about chain pizza stores, right? Pizza chains. So that might actually deserve a page of its own. Whereas these I can put the advantages and disadvantages on one page. Um, when I go to chains, I might want to have a separate page that talks about Pizza Hut and a separate page that talks about Marcos and, and so on down the line. That's always a judgment call when you're creating a page. Like, should I have one page that has a lot of stuff on it? Or should I have several pages, each which has just a little bit on it? That's a judgment call. You go for a sweet spot. You know, you go for what makes sense for the particular project you're working on, right? You don't necessarily want to have a separate page for every little tiny piece of information on your site. Then people have to click around to find everything. On the other hand, you don't necessarily want to have one gigantic page. You know, you want to divide it in a logical way. So just for the sake of argument, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a page for um, chain pizza shops. And then we'll create a link to that. All right. So let me go in and first of all, I'm going to create a section for the chains. I may then have a list of pros and cons for chains in general. I'll just put a little placeholder here. Now I might have a paragraph about chains in general. And then I might want to have a, a separate page for a list of the most popular chains. All right. So let me go. I'm going to save this. Then I'm going to click Save As. And I'm going to save this as Chain. So I'm going to save a copy of this page as Chain. I am just going in and maybe I'll have a list of the national changes, chains. Why do I want to say change? Chains. And again, if I was ranking them by like the sales, like what pizza shop, what pizza chain had the most sales in the United States, I might use an ordered list. All right. But in this case, I'm just going to list them in, a, in an arbitrary order. So I am going to use an unordered list for those. And I'll just put two or three in here.
Have I ever heard of Pizza Bogo? No, I have not. Where, uh, is it is it around here? Okay, well, I, I I'll have to keep my eyes open for that. Well, I will keep that in mind. There, of course, is Little Caesars, but they probably deserve a page all their own. No, I'm just kidding about that. Uh, okay, so again, I'm not completing this page. I'm just putting the basic stuff in here, but you can imagine we could have a paragraph for each pizza chain and we could talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that specific pizza chain and we could have links to their page and we could have all that stuff in here but in the interest of time I'm not going to complete that. Uh, I'm more interested in creating a link to it. So I click save here and here's the page. If I double click on it I get it and there's my page that again I'm not having I'm not going to fill it out with content but you can imagine that now I want to link these two pages together alright I want to link this page and this page together so I can click from one and just go to the other alright I'm going to open up in Notepad++ just for the heck of it. Some people like to use this. What you can do with Notepad++ is you can expand or hide the contents of a tag. So for example, if I click on this little minus side, it sort of compresses that title tag and I don't have to look at the details for it. If I hit the plus, it expands it then. All right. So this is still just a plain old text editor. It's, it's just like Notepad, but there's some additional features in it. All right, I want to create a link for this. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to say, here is a page that discusses chains in... more detail. Now, I'm going to make this the text of my link. Now, again, keeping in mind the thought process that we talked about last time, we're linking to another page. Well, we might have 20 pages on our site or 100 pages on our site. We need to tell it which is the name of the page that we want to go to. Now this isn't a section of this page and this isn't another page that's on someone else's web server. This is one of my own pages on presumably my own web server. So the rules for creating a link are a little bit different. In this case, assuming that everything is on, everything is in the same folder all I need to do is put the name of the file as the href. I don't have to put HTTP or I don't have to put pound signs or anything like that. So in this case, the name of my file is chain.html. So I just say href equals chain.html. No HTTP, no pound sign, just the name of it. Again, this is assuming that it's in the same folder. Now, both of these files are on the desktop, and in other words, they're in the same folder. All right? So, let's save this. And open up the page. Notice that's underlined, 
and it's magenta because we've already opened up that page. So the browser knows we've already opened up that page. But if I click on it, it takes me over to that page. Now to get the navigation to kind of come full circle, I want to have a link on this page that takes me back to my main page. All right. So I will go into the chain page, edit it with Notepad. and put a link into that. A href equals the name of the page, home, and then slash A. So now I have a link from my home page to the page about chain pizzas, and then I have a link back home. All right? Yes? So if they're not in the same location, does it not work? Good question. Um, if, what if it is in a different location? All right? Typically, when it's in a quote different location, it'll be like in a subfolder. All right? In which case you would just put the name of the folder and then the file name. So, if I had a folder here and I called it extra, let's say. And my chain was in the folder called extra. If I wanted to create a link to it, I'd have to put the folder name like that, extra slash, and then the name of it. Now the link back, I would do dot dot slash. We'll cover this more in detail later on. All right. But if any of you have had like the operating systems class, CISS 125, and you've talked about folders and dot dot means go up a folder and the folder name means to go down to that folder. It's the same sort of syntax. All right. But to answer your question directly, yeah, you just put, you put the path to it. Uh, for the first examples, I like to keep it simple and just keep everything in the same folder. Now again, it's important that you get the name exactly right. Because if this was named chain.htmn, htm, it still looks like a web page. If I were to go and turn the file extensions off, And all I would see is the first part of the name, I would click on pizza, open it up. If I went to this link, I get an error. All right. Why do I get an error? This page can't be displayed. Well, because my link is looking for chain.html and my file is chain.htm. Now, with the file extensions turned off, I can't see the full file name. So I don't know what the problem is. All right? And it looks like I created the link correctly because the file name is chain. I can't see the full extension, though, to know that it has htm instead of html. So it's very important to go in and make sure your file extensions are turned on and are not hidden. Then I can see, oh, the name is actually .htm, not .html. No. 
Um, in the old days, on certain computer systems, files could only have three character extensions. All right. So therefore, um, for certain kinds of files, they have a three character extension and they have a four character extension. Uh, and this is true for JPEG, because JPEGs could be JPEG, or they could be JPG, or they could be JPE. All right. So those are just examples of, well, the full extension is JPEG, but in the old days, since they had to be three character extensions, certain software abbreviated them to be JPG or JPE. All right? And the same thing with .htm. The bottom line is if you have the whole file name, including the file extension, you can see exactly what it's called and you can get the link or the image or whatever right. Any questions about any of this so far? Images. All right. We talked a little bit about images as far as copyright and fair use, and there's a fair use handout that, that is on, on, uh, um, within the course. Let's say we wanted to put a picture of a pizza on our web page. It would make sense, right? I mean... Um, we could even put a picture of, of uh, like the different chains pizzas, so you could look at it and say, boy, that looks good, or eh, that doesn't look so hot. Uh, you could put pictures of the frozen pizzas so that you can look at and immediately recognize the box, or so on. So there's a lot of reasons why we could put pictures on our page. For one is for decoration, to make the page look better. Um, but really, there are, uh, you can convey other information with an image that you can't indicate with simply text. All right? Pictures worth a thousand words, as they say. All right? So I'm going to go out on the web, and I know a couple people came in right. And what's your name? So Kelly and Pamela are the only two not here, right? All right. Let's go and let's look for images. So I'll do a search for pizza. And I'll click on images. And oh boy. This wasn't a good idea. Oh, look at all these beautiful. Oh, a heart-shaped pizza. How nice. And again, here's where a case of, yeah, a picture of pizzas would be good just because it would make the page look nicer. But you could also convey information. For example, I don't know how clear you can see, but this is like one of them giant deep dish pizzas. Wow. You can see that, and you can see really the difference between that and, say, a thin crust pizza. So you could look at it and say, oh, wow, I didn't know they made them that thick. Where could I get one of those? Oh, that looks like a Pizzeria Uno pizza, and so on. <laughs> one like a controller. Wow. Oh my God, look at this one. It's like a giant pizza skyscraper. At any rate, I'm just going to pick an image here. All right? Now remember, <clears throat> when we use an image like this, because this is not our image, we have to cite the source for it. Just as if you were writing a term paper, <clears throat> and you were quoting someone or using a diagram or whatever. So I'm going to pick Pardon me? Yeah, I do. I, I well I wanna I wanna Avoid picking one from an unsavory site. I will pick this one. The best pizzeria is in Boston. So I'm going to view image. 
<clears throat> and I'm going to right mouse on the image and save image as. And I'm going to save it on my desktop. And I'll go and click save. And that image comes from this page. All right. So I'm going to remember that <clears throat> because just like if I was writing a term paper, I have to put a citation saying that I got this picture from this from this place. Yes, you're allowed to. You're allowed to link to any page. You do not need special permission to create a link to someone's page. All right. <clears throat> you do need. Uh, you do need either their permission or, again, in an educational context, fair use to use someone else's content. All right. The idea is, is if you create a link somewhere, um, you're not passing that off as your own. You know, you're saying that. You know, Boston.com had a review of Boston Pizza Places, and you create a link to it. You're not saying, I wrote a review of Boston Pizza Places, or I took this picture of pizza, or whatever, you know. So therefore, that's a different, you're, you're pointing somewhere else. All right, so let's go, and we notice we have that image here. Pizza. I'm going to rename it to give it a, a, a better name, because that is... That's kind of a long name. So I'm just going to go in here and rename. And I'm just going to rename it pizza.jpg. All right. Now let's say I want to go and put it on my home page or my pizza page. The tag for images is IMG. Now, just like with a link, I have to give more information because on my website I could have a lot of images. Do I want to show the image of a cheese pizza here or a thick crust or a thin crust or whatever? I have to specify specifically the name of the image I want to show. And again, remember, the way that we indicate additional information about a tag is through what's uh, an attribute. So with links, we had the href attribute. That was the name of the page that we wanted to link to. With images, we have the src attribute. And then we put in quotes the name of the page. There's one other attribute with images. And I'll just bring it up now, and we'll go over this in, in a lot more detail later on. But there is an alt attribute, ALT. And an alt attribute is alternative text. And its main purpose is if someone is visually impaired and they're accessing your page through a screen reader, all right? There's software that narrates the screen to people. All right. Obviously, it can't say, it can't describe the image, but you can supply some text that at least tells a person that is accessing this page via a screen reader what the image is of, so that they at least have a sense of what the image is. So I can say a picture of a pizza. Now again, that certainly doesn't replace the experience of seeing the pizza, but it at least gives the visually impaired user an idea of what that image is. So now let's go and look at it. And we open this page, and there we go. And there is our image. With every image you have, you should have 
two attributes, an SRC and an ALT attribute. The SRC says what the name of the file is. The alt attribute says a description of what the image is. JPG or JPEGs are one kind of image file. What are some other kind of image files? PNG and GIF, GIF or GIF, depending on, on how you pronounce it. Um, that would depend on the browser. You can count on browsers supporting those three formats that we just said, JPEG, um, GIF, and PNG. They have their own distinct advantages and disadvantages. All right? JPEGs and PNG are typically used for photographs. All right? GIFs are often used for like line drawings, like, like logos. You know, if I was doing a logo for my organization and it was like a, you know, a, a um, you know, a little drawing of a guy in a chef's hat with a pizza in his hand, and it was like a drawing more than a photo of that, then a GIF might be good for that. GIFs and PNGs support transparency. So I can have portions of an image transparent if I use those formats. And that can come in handy. Whereas JPEGs do not support transparency. Now this isn't a class in, in image manipulation. Uh, it's not a multimedia class. But you should be aware of some aspects of, of images. And every web developer should know some basics of manipulating and editing images. For example, in this case, if I look at this image on the page, that's kind of big. Maybe I can make the image smaller. All right? So, I can use really any image manipulation program to resize the image. Now, one thing I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to make a copy of the image first before I resize it. All right? Why am I going to make a copy for, uh, of it before I resize it? In case I mess it up. All right. Specifically with resizing, what is the implication? The resolution. Right. In other words, if I make an image smaller, effectively I'm losing information. I'm losing detail. Once you've lost that detail, you can't get it back again. All right. So, for example, if I go in here and, and I'm going to copy this image and paste it as a backup over here. If I go in and I edit this image, and it's opening up good old Microsoft Paint, all right? If I go and resize this, which is where here? Yeah, resize. And I make it 10% of its original size. All right, so we got a little tiny mini pizza. I go and save this. View the page again. I go, oh shoot, that's way too small. Let me make it bigger. If I go in here and say, well, let me resize this. to make it 10 times bigger, OK, 5 times bigger. You can probably see on the projector that it's blurry. All right. And in fact, if I go in and make it again, See, I'm determined. I'm not. I'm going to make it ten times bigger. If I make it five times bigger, and I make that two times bigger. So there. You notice that again. It might not be obvious with the uh, projector, but that's. You can see on the monitor that that's very blurry. The other thing that you might not see is this area looks all white here, 
But there's actually like artifacts of the resizing. If I look at it on the monitor, actually there is like some green areas here, very light green pixels and very light like magenta pixels and all that. Simply because of the loss of information when you resize it and make it smaller. So if this was my only copy of the image and I made it small, I could never get back to the original. What I can do instead though is say, all right, I messed that one up. Let me go copy this guy over. Rename it. Now I'm going to go in and edit this guy. And instead of making, now to notice this, the original is very sharp and you can again probably even see on the screen. You definitely can see on the monitor. And instead of making it um, one-tenth as big, I'm going to make it maybe a quarter as big. Save it. And I'm back in business now. All right. So that's your first rule. Always have, a, a, always have the original highest resolution of the photograph saved somewhere. So if you resize it and you decide to change it again, you know, you can't make an image that was made smaller, you can't make it bigger without losing uh, data and, and, and messing it up. What are ways that you can obtain images for your website? And it sounds like a dumb question, but there's actually more answers here than you might think. You had to do a website. Someone comes down and says, do a website for my new pizza shop. What are ways that you could get images for your site? Yeah, number one is you could go with a camera and take pictures. All right. What's right or wrong with that approach? What's the advantages and disadvantages of that approach? Right. Number one, there's no copyright issues if you take the picture. All right. Number two, you get it for free if you take the picture, if you're doing it for your own pizza place. You know, it doesn't cost you anything other than, well, if you already have the camera. All right. Another advantage, what would another advantage be? You're an awesome photographer. All right. Okay. You can do it yourself and not rely on anyone else. That's, that's definitely true. You can get the exact picture that you want. So, for example, they will be seeing your pizza, not a Totino's pizza that you got the image from somewhere else. So, in other words, if there's something special about your pizza that you want to showcase, all right, you can do that if you take the picture yourself because you can go bake a pizza, put it down, snap a picture of it. All right, so there's no question. You, you, don't, you don't say, well, here's a generic picture of a pizza. This is my pizza. This is what you're going to get if you come into my pizza place. And that's an advantage. You can get better content. Specifically, you can get the exact picture that you want, all right, if you do that. What are the disadvantages of doing that? This applies to everyone but, um, but Janet. The cost of the equipment, right. You might not be an awesome photographer. All right. And that's probably it, right? You might not have the facilities for the lighting and so on. Pardon me? Could be time consuming. Could be something that like, hey, uh, you know, to sound like... Uh, Dr. McCoy on, on Star Trek, I'm a pizza baker, not a photographer, right? You know, and so you might not want to spend the time doing that. So what are your other options? Well, again, the problem with Google is if you're doing this for this class, that's acceptable. However, if you're doing it for a commercial enterprise, that sore, that probably isn't allowed. And we'll come to the probably part later. Go to a stock photo website. All right. What are stock photos? Well, let's Google stock photos.
All these pictures are available for you to use. So let's say you don't really make any kind of exotic specialty pizzas. There's a good chance your pepperoni pizza is going to look a lot like this, <laughs> right? So you could go and do that. Now, you go and you pay for it. These are royalty free. What does royalty free mean? You don't owe the original artist any money based on how many times you use it. So in other words, if I were to print a flyer or a brochure, they wouldn't get paid a certain amount of money for that. Or if I made a book and put it on there. They wouldn't get paid a certain amount of money per each copy of the book. It was just one flat amount and you pay it. Now what are the advantages of this? The advantage of this is you, you still get a professional photograph, uh, photograph. Or at least you can pick the exact one that you want and you will pick one that looks good. All right. Um, it doesn't take you much time just going in and finding it and selecting it and so on. So it's not like as much time as it would take someone for lining up a shot and getting the lining, uh, lighting just right and so on. It's not going to be exactly what you want. I might have to settle. You know, I might have to say, well, gee, our pizza doesn't look exactly like that, but, you know, hey, that's close enough, you know. And you have to pay for it. All right, so those are the disadvantages of using that. All right. It's interesting because the web really um, was a game changer as far as stock photography goes. All right. Back in the old days, a professional photographer could make good money just by having a big portfolio of stock photos. So, like, if you wanted to do a brochure for your pizza company or you wanted to, um, you know, do a advertisement for your sporting goods store or whatever, you would go to a photographer, look through the list of pictures, pick it, and you'd pay a good price. Well, what do we know about economics, supply and demand, all right? Now that you can get a good camera for relatively inexpensive, all right, a lot of people can go and put their, make their pictures available as stock photos. And as the supply goes up, all right, the cost goes down. So really, professional photographers really took a hit with the web as far as stock photography goes. All right? So that'd be a second one. I suppose another thing you could do is you could actually hire a professional photographer if you're not one yourself. So then you could get something that looks exactly the way you want it to, but again, you're going to pay a premium for that. The last way is through the use of what's called Creative Commons licensing. What is Creative Commons licensing? No. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Creative Commons is where people that make creative work, and it's audio, video, images, any sort of creative work, put their stuff out there and say, look, you can use it, but you have to give me credit, and you have certain restrictions. All right? One restriction might be that you can use it if you're a nonprofit organization, but you can't do, use it if you're a for-profit business. So that might be one restriction. So if I was doing a charity fundraiser and we had a pizza sale, I might be able to use a photo for free. But if I was opening up a pizza parlor, I would not be able to use it. All right. Um, another restriction might be I can use it, but I can't alter it. I think that's where your thinking was. All right. So I could take and use that picture of a pizza, but I couldn't go and alter it and add Godzilla taking a bite out of it or something like that. All right. That would not be legal. How do you find things licensed with a Creative Commons license? Well, if you go to advanced search in Google, I could search for pictures of pizza. that are 
free to use or share even commercially. So the pictures I find when I do this search are pictures that I could use even if I was running a business as long as I give credit. And let's try that again. These apparently are licensed under Creative Commons, so I could use these even commercially. All right. I would still have to give credit. But the other thing you can do is many photo services, for example, Flickr, you can go in and, I didn't want to do that. Within, Flickr is a image sharing site, so I could look for pictures of pizza, and then I could go into the advanced search. Oh, there we go. Any license or commercial use allowed. Now again, with this you're going to, you know, it's absolutely free, but you get what you pay for, right? Notice that there is a wide range of quality here. This isn't a particularly good image of a pizza, but it's free. Some of these aren't so bad. All right. Why would a creative person license their work to be used by Creative Commons. Get their name out. Right. You know, get, you know, if, if you get, you know, if you get your, um, you know, if, if people see that it's used, maybe they, maybe you'll be hired for a paying gig. What's another reason that you might do it? For portfolio, right? That's, that's related, but yeah. You know, you could put on a resume, my photography was featured on, you know, pizzavillage.com or whatever. Another thing is, is that you could, by restricting the license, I could say that nonprofits could use it. So if I was, um, if I wanted to do work that, you know, hey, um, if you're a charity, you can use my images. That way, you know, I feel like I'm doing some good. I'm making my images available to nonprofit organizations, and you know, and those folks, I'll let them have it for free. But if you're opening up a for-profit business, then I want to get paid for my image. So that's another reasonable way to do it. You might feel okay with donating your image for free to a nonprofit, but want to get paid <laughs> for it if a business is using it. And when you create content, you can create your license. You, you can put the, the terms by which the, 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 um, your image can be used. So there, there, there's, you know, you, you might have thought of the question of, you know, where can I get images? It's like, well, you take the picture. And that is part of the answer, but that's not the whole answer. And it's important as you're going in and thinking of creating a website, all right, if, if, for example, if you did web development on the side and someone asked you to do that, to understand what these options are, you know. I'm going to go and make sure that I practice what I preach, and I'm going to put this as a credit. Now, where do you put the credits? Um... From my perspective, as long as you put it somewhere, I think you've done your job. So, for example, I could have a paragraph at the end that would say, image of pizza from... And if you do that, I think you've done your obligation. Doesn't even need, really need to be a link, in my opinion, as long as you cite it. You could also have maybe a page, 
a separate page that says, here's my credits. You know, images of pizzas uh, from such and such site, images of calzones from such and such site, and so on down the line. We're going to look at one other kind of link before we get into CSS. All right? And that link is an email link. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to put my footer. I'm going to make mzellers a link. And I want to make it a link to my email address. So, I'm going to go a href equals and instead of HTTP, I say mail to, then I can put my email address. And when I do that, then If I click on that, it's going to open up whatever email application is installed on my computer. Now this computer doesn't have, has Outlook installed, but it's not set up. So it doesn't know exactly what to do here. All right. But if this was like another person's machine that did have their email client set up, it would actually go and create an email address to that person and all they'd have to do is type in the body and click send. So you do that with a mail to as an href. All right. I like to do things a little bit out of order. Um, I think in a textbook one of the chapters early on is about formatting text. Well, we're not going to talk about that today. Um, we'll come back and we'll hit some of the highlights of it probably next time. But it's kind of a boring chapter, so I try to put it off as long as I can. All right, and instead we're going to talk about fun stuff. All right, keep in mind when I use the word fun, I'm talking about my version of fun, not anyone else's version of fun. So your mileage may vary. But we're going to talk about, we're going to start talking about CSS. And CSS is where you can control the appearance of your web page. You'll be able to control every aspect of the appearance of your web page, virtually every aspect. All right? So, what kind of font? You can control that with CSS. How big are the letters? You can control that with CSS. What color do you make something? CSS. Almost anything you can think of. How much space is between letters? Control that with CSS. How much space is between lines of text? Control that with CSS. So anything that you can think of that relates to the appearance of the page is controllable via CSS. So the way your page looks is a combination of the browser defaults and what you've controlled via CSS. What are browser defaults? Well, there's certain default fonts, certain default colors, certain default sizes for things, and so on. So links are blue unless they're visited, then they're magenta. All right? H1s are the biggest header, H2s are next big, and so on down the line. All those are controlled by browser defaults. We're going to start off by looking at colors and changing the colors of our page. And I was going to say something, but I should probably ask the question. Is there anyone in class that's colorblind? All right. I actually had someone last semester that was, and I had to be careful how I spoke because I realized I wasn't speaking for everyone when I was, was talking about that. But colorblind... Uh, with the exception of people that are colorblind, color is probably the most obvious thing I can talk about changing in a page that you'll be able to see instantly. So it's a good idea, I think it's a good idea to, to do that as a first example. Later on when we talk about accessibility, we'll talk about some of the things you can do to help colorblind people see your page. But for now, 
we'll just assume that everyone can see colors correctly. All right. I want to put in my CSS code. My CSS code is going to appear in the head section. All right. My CSS code is put within a style tag. Now I can do this a couple different ways, but this is the easiest, more straightforward way to start, so that's what I'll do. The style tag tells a browser, hey, you're no longer in HTML land. You're in CSS land. So any code between the start and end style tag is not HTML code, but it is CSS code. All right. CSS is a set of rules that get applied to your page. The rules have two parts. The rules have a selector and then a set of attributes and values. So all these things constitute a style rule. So we're going to start out and we're going to see an example of a style rule that has a selector, has attributes and values. And we're going to go over the most simple, most basic examples first, but know that each of these can get more complicated. The selector can get complicated. The attributes and values can get more complicated. All right? The selector identifies what on the page the rule applies to. So, for example, if I say H1, And then I have some stuff here. That means that every H1 on the page, this rule applies to. It doesn't apply to H2s. It doesn't apply to H3s. It doesn't apply to paragraphs, links, whatever. This defines what tags on the page get the rule. This are the attributes that are going to get applied to those H1s. So if I say background yellow, color, well, let's just start with background yellow. That's saying that the background of H1s is going to be set to yellow. All right. This style rule, the specific style rule, only addresses H1s. It doesn't apply to anything else on the page. It does apply to every H1 on the page. Every H1 on the page, I'm going to make the background color of it, yellow. All right. Selector, attribute, what characteristic of the, pay, of the element am I changing? I'm changing its background color. What am I changing it to? Yellow. Colon, semicolon. The name of the attribute, colon. The value of the attribute, semicolon. All right. Let's look, let's actually go and make this change. And then we will go from there. Whoa. Is anyone trained in first aid, by the way? <laughs> All right. H1. Background. yellow. Okay, so I save that. 
and I go and click refresh, I notice my H1s now have a background of yellow. All right, Didn't change anything else but H1s, and it changed all of them. Now, later on, you know, the, the question that I always get asked is, what if I don't want to change every single H1? We'll cover that later on. But for right now, we're going to deal with the most simple se selectors, and that is by changing every tag of a certain tag name to have certain attributes. The background color is the color behind the text, of course. If I want to change the color of the text itself, that is simply color. And I can make it blue if I want. All right. Probably can see that that is. blue text on a yellow background. Now, I don't know, that's not really good for a, a pizza place, is it? What would be good colors for a pizza place? Yeah, I was going to say, do we have any, any Italian folks in here? And what are the colors of the flag of Italy? They are red, white, and green, I think. All right. In fact, that's where supposedly the first pizza, the, God, what do they call that? The, uh, pardon me? Margarita. The margarita pizza, thank you. Another pizza fan in here. Is supposedly that, made that way because it matches the colors of the Italian flag. The white mozzarella cheese, uh, the green basil, and the red tomatoes or tomato sauce. So let's go and let us change the color of some things and let's make the background of H1's red and the color white. All right. I'm going to then make the H2 background green color white. Now, it's a different selector, H2. So different things on the page get this rule. Now, notice how I've put these on separate lines. It doesn't matter. I can do this if I want. All right? Or I can do this if I think that that is more readable. So I go and save this and look at the page. There we go. All right? Now, notice what this has done. And again, we talked a little bit about web design. And we talked about how web design is not just about making your page look pretty, but about adding functionality and adding clarity to your page. We've done two things by adding these colors to the page. Number one, we've made it look like a pizza place. We've given it the colors of the Italian flag, so the red, white, and green that gives that evokes a certain feeling, all right, for this. But we've also, by put these, putting these out there, helped structure the page. Now we can see this is sort of the header section. This is a section, this is a section, and so on. All right. So we've helped our reader mentally organize the page. All right. Um, one book I read on web design said one way to look at a design, and I kind of talked about this before, take your glasses off or blur your eyes, but look at it. And I can see at a glance where the sections of the page are, even if I can't read the words. 
So we're using color not just to make it look good. That's a goal, right? We want to evoke a mood, right? But we also use color to add clarity, add structure to the way the page is. All right? So we're not just going to put color in here just to make it look nice. All right? One thing to keep in mind, too, is with CSS, we're going to learn how to make every single tag on the page a different color. Does that mean that you want to do that? No. All right? You want to carefully use it in such a way where it's meaningful. All right? If everything on the page looks the same, but there's a couple things that are a different color, those stand out, right? The page still is essentially mostly a white background with black font on it. But we have a few things that are different. Those stand out. If every single thing on the page was a different color, those things would no longer stand out. Those things would get lost in the shuffle. All right? So you want to use colors discreetly. You don't want to use 10 colors. Maybe you, you want to use three colors in addition to maybe, you know, white and black you sort of get for free as well as any grays. Those, don't, those are neutrals. They don't really count. But like as far as colors that stand out, a couple of them, two or three of them. Don't want to don't want overkill of them. The same thing can be said for fonts. The same thing can be said for almost anything. Discrete use of them, use of them is good. That makes things stand out. That provides focus. Overkill just makes it a big mess where nothing stands out. All right, so what can we do next? What colors do we have? Can I type any color name in there and it'll work? Well, no. There's a lot of color names. Let's Google HTML color names. And I can see the list of color names. I don't know if these, this is a complete list. Actually, yeah. Let me, let me find another page. Here we go. So I have choices. For example, I'm sitting staring at the monitor and I can't see the difference between green and forest green, but apparently there is a difference. All right. Let's make a more obvious one. Let's change it from green to dark green. made that a little bit darker. I could find the color that most matched the Italian flag if I wanted to go that route and, and use that. So you have a whole list of names for colors that you can use. And there's a lot of them. But there's definitely a finite one. All right. Notice, however, that next to the color, the name of the color, is a six-character code. All right? 
That's another way of saying the color. By using this, we have virtually access to millions of colors instead of just these finite hundred or so that we have listed here. So for example, the code for dark green is this. So I could copy that and instead of putting the word dark green, I can put pound sign and that code in. And it will work the same way. No, this doesn't look any different. Now, I'm going to explain how that code works. All right? The good thing, though, is that these color codes are like gravity. All right? Doesn't matter where you are, whether you understand how it works or not it still works. So even if you don't understand how the color code values work, if you simply go to a page and copy the color code that you want, oops, it'll work even if you don't understand how it works. All right. These color codes are all six digits long, six characters long. Back when they first started making big, giant TVs, they were projecting TVs, right? They would have three sources of light and they'd project three images. One of those images was in red, one of them was green, and one of them was blue. All right? And the interesting thing with light is with those three lights, you can create any color you want, believe it or not. Any color is a mix of red, green, and blue light. All right? So you'd even notice in those old TVs, if the, if the cameras or, or projectors weren't lined up correctly, you'd see like a little ghost image or whatever, and it had to be aligned just right and all that, and they do so much better with TVs now, but if any of you remember that, it's based on the same principle. So, we have six characters. Two of them are for red, two of them are for green, and two of them are for blue. With these six character codes, effectively what we're doing is we're saying how much red we want, how much green we want, and how much blue we want. How high are we going to turn up that red lamp? How high are we going to turn up that green lamp? How high are we going to turn up that blue lamp? All right? These color codes use what are called hexadecimal numbers. Sometimes just abbreviated as saying hex codes. Our normal number system is decimal. It's based on 10, right? That means we have 10 digits. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 10 digits. Hexadecimal is base 16, which means that there are 16 digits. What does that mean? Well, we have... 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. To represent the next six numbers, we use A, B, C, D, E, and F. All right? So if we're going to count in decimal, we'd say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. If we're counting in hex, we would say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. What's after F? 1, 0. 1, 1, 
and so on down the line. 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 1, 6, 1, 7, 1, 8, 1, 9, 1, A, B, C, D, E, F, 2, 0. So in decimals, the highest two-digit number we can have is 99. So in decimals, a two-digit number can go anywhere from 0, 0 to 99. In hex, it can go from 0, 0 to FF. FF is the light turned on full blast. 0, 0 is the light turned off completely. So, first two are red, green, and blue. What would this color be? That would be red. And not only would it be red, it would be the brightest red possible. It would be the reddest red. All right. What color would this be? It would be purple. It would be a bright purple. It would be a purple where the red and blue are balanced. All right. If I were to make this something like 99, describe the difference between this purple and the previous purple. Not as bright. That's true. This would be a little less bright. This would be darker. What else about this? It'd be more reddish. So this would be a reddish purple as opposed to a purple purple or a bluish purple. All right. What's a bigger number in hex? One zero or zero A? Which one? One zero is a bigger number. Why? Which one's a bigger number? How do you tell? Just like you'd tell with regular numbers. You'd compare the furthermost position. One is bigger than zero, so this one's bigger. What about like AF versus FA? Well, F is bigger than A, so this one would be higher. Again, the good news about this is that even if you don't understand how it works, it still works. So go to a color chart, just copy the code, and you're in business. I do think it's beneficial to sort of have an idea how these work. Let's play around with this a little bit. And keep in mind in my example, sometimes I use ugly colors on purpose just because they're obvious, just because you can see at a glance that. So let's go in and let's play with the color of the H1. So, right now it's set as red. So it looks like that. If I go in and change this to pound sign FF0000, it's not going to look any different because that's red. If I change this to AA, zero, 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 zero. What's it going to look like? Faded or a little bit darker red? So if I go and look at this now, notice this is how it was before. If I hit refresh, there notice it's a little bit darker. All right. If I made it so dark, I could do like zero A. It's going to be red, but it's going to be close to black, all right, because I've turned the red way, way down. In fact, if I do that on this monitor, even on the monitor looking at this, it looks black, but it is slightly red. All right, let's, let's make it a little bit bigger. Let's make it 2-0.
Still can't tell. Let's make it seven zero. There on the screen, looking at it, I can just start to tell it's, it's turning red, all right, as opposed to black. What would this color be? Equal amounts of red, green, and blue. Brown, good guess. It'd be a grayish, right? All right. Equal parts of red, green, and blue are gray. So, if I were to do this and look, it's a gray. Now, what if I made this, I have 707070, what if I made it, A, 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 A. Still be gray, right? Because it's equal parts red, green, and blue. How would it compare to the gray that I had before? It'd be a lighter gray. It'd be closer to white. All right? So there we go. It's a lighter gray. What would white then be? All Fs. In fact, if we do this, we're not going to be able to see the text because it's going to be white text on a white background. Oops. All right. It's there, but it's white text on a white background. What would black then be? It would be all zeros. What would something like this look like? F-F-A-A-A-A. -A -A -A. Be like a light or like pale red. So it would be like a white that was slightly tinted um, red. Pardon me? Maybe? Kind of pink, yeah, I suppose. Peach, maybe? I don't know. All right. Again, the good thing is, is that you don't have to memorize this to know how it works. If you look at a color and you like it, and we can analyze these, dark blue is 00008B, well, no red, no green, and the blues turned up a little bit. So we get a darker blue than we would here or here. Royal blue has a little bit of green and, and red into it. I mean, this is really no different than like, well, it's different in some respects, but it's, it's similar to what you do when you go to a paint shop, right? When you go to a paint shop, it's not like they have a can of, you know, one million cans of different colors of paint. They have white paint and they have pigment and they add it to it and mix it to make the color that you asked for. All right? Sort of the same idea here. Now, in the case of our original example where we had red and green, It's pretty clear that those are the colors that we want to work together because they have a specific meaning. You know, they evoke Italy and Italian things. All right? 
The question then becomes, how do you know what colors go together in other cases? All right. You probably know some people that, you know, maybe the way they dress. Wow, they, their dress, you know, the way they dress always looks really good. They always match things together and they always look impeccable. You know, their shirt matches their pants and their jacket matches everything else and really unique color combinations, but they still look good. Then you have other people that like, you know, orange shirt with a purple pants and a yellow tie or something like that. You know, I kind of fall into that category sometimes. All right. Does that mean that the person that is good at matching colors, well, let me rephrase that. Does that mean that the person that's bad at matching colors is without any hope of becoming a web developer? No. Why not? Because, believe it or not, there's science involved in what colors go together. All right? The science of optics. There are all sorts of things that we don't need to get into, but there are rules and there are ways of matching colors together. What we will do next time is look at some color scheme generators where if you're not really sure what color goes with what color, you can use one of these and you can come up with a respectable looking web page even if you have no color sense whatsoever. All right, You can make sure that the colors do go together and do match. All right. So that's where we will begin next time, is looking at color scheme generators, where we're going to look at um, taking and making good combinations of colors, not just one or two colors. All right, we'll see you over in lab.